Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Benjamin. I'm the president of the American Academy in Berlin, and I am delighted to welcome you to this evening's uh, lecture, Theater, Democracy, and the Making of an American Culture War by James Shapiro, who is this semester's Gerhard Kasper Fellow. Um, just uh, before I introduce our speaker, uh, a word on the fellowship. Uh, the Gerhard Kasper Fellowship has been made possible through the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and um, especially uh, its advocate was uh, the late Vartan Gregorian, who was president of Carnegie from 1997 until his passing in 2021, and a, an outstanding trustee of the American Academy. Um, the fellowship is named in honor of Gerhard Kasper, uh, who many of you will know as the former president of Stanford University and the former dean of the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, Gerhard occupies a special place in the history of the Academy as a longtime trustee and as someone who twice served as acting president of the institution. Uh, Gerhard um, was and remains a tremendous champion of academic excellence, of scholarship, and although he was a law professor, uh, a great advocate of the humanities, which is why the fellowship uh, in his name always goes to a humanist. And... Um, with writer, literary scholar, and educator uh, James Shapiro. We have a fellow whose career is perfect for this fellowship. Uh, James has threatened me. Um, if I go on too long, he's going to uh, uh, revert to his days as a fencer. <laughs> Wait till he finds out. <sighs> what a good fencer I can be. Um, so anyway, uh, our speaker tonight uh, is the world-renowned Shakespeare scholar uh, and Larry Miller Professor of English and Comparative Literature at Columbia University, where he has taught since 1985. Um, I'm not giving much away when I say that seeing uh, Jim's name in the applicant pool last year reassured me that we were still attracting the very best. He earned his BA and MA from Columbia uh, and his PhD from the University of Chicago, so another shared affiliation with Gerhard Kasper. Um, Shapiro is the author of six books about William Shakespeare. He's edited a Shakespeare anthology for the Library of America, produced a documentary about Shakespeare for the BBC, and has been uh, for about a decade the Shakespeare scholar in residence at New York Public Theater. Um, I'm going to not mention all of the books that he has written um, because of the physical threat that he has posed. Um, but uh, the one that I do uh, want to mention, well, a couple of things I want to mention was his most recent book is Shakespeare in a Divided America, which was published by Penguin in 2020, and um, uh, which got the uh, extraordinary uh, accolade of being one of the New York Times' 10 best uh, of the year. Uh, for those of us who've only made it to the top 99, I'm terribly envious. Um, it was also a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for Nonfiction. Uh, he won the Samuel Johnson Prize when it was the Samuel Johnson Prize. It has since been renamed the Bailey Gifford uh, Prize. Um, uh, and um, we're not going to talk about who Bailey Gifford is. I think you all know who Dr. Johnson was. Um, and then it was later awarded, again, the winner of winners, which is to say the best uh, Samuel Johnson or Bailey Gifford uh, book award of uh, 25 years uh, of Bailey Gifford and Samuel Johnson book awards. And that was for his uh, book on... Um, that's not the year of Lear. 1599, right. Especially 1599, a year in the life of William Shakespeare. It's right there. Um, anyway, uh, he's received um, fellowships from just about everyone who gives them out, including uh, the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities, the Guggenheim Foundation, and the Cullman Center for Scholars and Writers. Uh, he is a member of the Academy of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, one of my favorite of his many uh, um, honors is that he is a governor of the Folger Shakespeare Library, which is an institution close to my family's heart since we lived a stone's throw from there for 20 years and even went in once in a while. And uh, he serves on the board of directors of the Royal Shakespeare Company. In Berlin, he is finishing The Playbook, a story of theater, democracy, and the making of a culture war, uh, an excerpt from which you will hear tonight. 
Um, and uh, the focus of this discussion is the America is America's federal theater project of the 1930s, an attempt to b bring drama to mass audiences uh, that was later uh, an, an attempt that was or an endeavor that was later targeted by the House Committee on Un-American Activities. Um, he is uh, looking at his watch. I'm fearing for my life. I'll just say he's also working on Othello and American Life. Uh, for the Black Lives series of Yale University, which will come out in 2027. You just have to wait another minute. Um, housekeeping. Uh, uh, Jim's talk will last about 35 minutes, and it will be uh, followed by Q&A. I am not moderating that. Uh, and if you are with us at the Academy, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Please wait for the microphone. If you're joining us via Zoom, please type your questions in the Q&A part of the Zoom platform. Okay, James, the floor is yours. I'm getting out of your way. All right. Can everyone hear me? It's great. Um, first, I want to thank Dan for that incredibly gracious introduction. Uh, I want to thank my fellow fellows. We've been here for three weeks or so. And it's a great crowd, and the Academy is an extraordinary place, in part because the staff is there to take care of every need. So they're going to have to change the locks to get rid of me and I suspect some of uh, my other fellows. It's been really a wonderful place to share ideas and to get work done. So um, I feel very privileged to be here. I'm going to speak for 34 minutes. Uh, I've been asked to sing for my supper, and what I'm really interested in is feedback. I've never uh, uh, spoken on this topic. I've written about it for the last four years or so. So this is my first time through, uh, and uh, I really want feedback uh, and uh, ask as probing and as difficult questions as you like, and I'll do my best to, to answer them. Let me begin by offering a thumbnail sketch of my book, which I'm close to finishing. I call it the playbook because it's both about the playbooks or scripts of the Federal Theater Project of the late 1930s, the only time America had anything approaching a national theater. But it is no less about the right-wing playbook, now widely and effectively employed, that was first assembled by Martin Dyes, uh, Texas congressman who chaired the first House Un-American Activities Committee and targeted and effectively destroyed the federal theater. My book recounts how the federal theater and the House Un-American Activities Committee came into existence at roughly the same time and explores the consequence of their collision. Its other chapters underscore what was at stake, delving into five uh, federal theater productions that I'm happy to elaborate on in the Q&A, productions that flirted with censorship, confronted the racial divide, tangled with Congress, tackled issues ignored or sanitized by Hollywood, and expanded the possibilities of what American theater and culture could be. And these are a groundbreaking production of Macbeth that opened at the Lafayette Theater in Harlem and toured as far as Jim Crow, Texas. Uh, an adaptation of Sinclair Lewis's novel, It Can't Happen Here, that opened uh, in 18 cities simultaneously. White modern dancers uh, performing black songs of protest in uh, a production called How Long Brethren. One third of a nation's expose of slum housing produced nationwide, and a brilliant and bitter expose of racism in America by two young black playwrights, Liberty Deferred, that was never staged. Taken together, they convey the range of productions that so riled the House Un American Activities Committee while capturing the federal theater at its stumbling and self censoring worst as well as its daringly innovative best. I'm here, as I said, to engage in conversation, so I'll keep this to under 35 minutes. 
The story I'll focus on in that time is from a section of the book that recounts how, uh, on December 6, 1938, for the first and perhaps only time in American history, the purpose of theater and its place in American democracy was hotly debated in a congressional hearing. That fraught exchange took place on the second floor of the old congressional building in Washington, D.C., where the recently formed House on American Activities Committee questioned its witnesses. The venue, with its high ceilings and huge chandeliers, its walls lined with theater exhibits that day, resembled a stage set for a courtroom drama. Two long tables uh, arranged in the shape of a T were at the center of the room. At its foot was a solitary witness chair. An audience of stenographers, reporters, photographers, and cameramen sat behind long tables on each side of the room, and they were drawn there in part by the committee's theatrics. As one observer put it, under the blinding glare of spotlights and a bombardment of photographer bulbs, committee members shout insults at each other and at witnesses who retort in kind. More than once, the, uh, the audience has been permitted to rise and cheer pronouncements of the chairman, Martin Dyes. Sitting at the head of the table that Tuesday morning were five members of that investigative committee. J. Parnell Thomas of New Jersey, John J. Dempsey of New Mexico, Joe Starnes of Alabama, Harold Mosher of Ohio, and his chairman, Martin Dyes, a tall and charismatic Texan in his late 30s who worked his way through eight cigars in the course of a day's hearing. While officially known as the Special Committee on Un-American Activities, everyone, including the press, called it the Dyes Committee. Its other members struggled to be more than a supporting cast. The committee authorized by Congress on May 26, 1938, was due to present its findings in less than a month. Its budget had been a, a measly $25,000, perhaps half of what it needed to hire enough investigators, signaling really Congress's uneasiness with authorizing the special committee, which had hamstrung by underfunding it. It meant that the Dyes Committee lacked both the time and the manpower to look at its ostensible targets, the rise of Nazism and uh, communism in the mid-1930s in America. So it reached for lower hanging fruit, public relief, which many Americans had grown weary of, focusing its attention especially on the federal theater project, one of the more contro controversial divisions of the WPA's Federal One, a program that had put to work thousands of unemployed writers, musicians, photographers, painters, and actors. It wasn't easy attacking murals that adorn public libraries or concerts or photographs or tourist handbooks. Theater offered a richer target, in part because it had become remarkably popular in part because it was easy to find and then read aloud incriminating passages from plays that sounded obscene or subversive, and in part, and this is why justified linking it to un-American activities, because it attracted many on the political left who hoped during the Depression, a time of massive unemployment, racial division, and income inequality, that plays could expose and help change what they found wrong in America. From 1935 until its demise in 1939, the Federal Theater Project staged, for a pittance or for free, over a thousand productions in 29 states seen by 30 million American spectators, or really one out of every four Americans alive at that time, two-thirds of whom, audience surveys revealed, had never seen a live play before. It offered traditional fare like Shakespeare, mixed in with contemporary plays on issues that mattered to Depression-era audiences, such as slum housing or the rise of fascism, topics largely shunned by Hollywood and the commercial stage. Led by a theater professor from Vassar College, her name was Hallie Flanagan, 
it employed at its peak over 12,000 struggling artists, some of whom, like Orson Welles and Arthur Miller, who was a fellow in the first class here at the Academy, they would soon become famous, but most of whom were just ordinary people eager to work again at their craft. It was the product of a moment when the arts, no less than industry and agriculture, were thought to be vital to the health of the Republic and deserving of its support. The Federal Theater brought children's plays on touring trucks to kids in crowded cities, and not just kids on touring trucks. That's one of the touring trucks there at uh, uh, Cretona Park to a crowd of several thousand New Yorkers performing there for free. It established what it called Negro units from Hartford to Seattle to support black actors and playwrights. It brought free theater to asylums, orphanages, hospitals, prisons, and veterans' homes. It revived playgoing in rural states where movies had all but ended it. Ten million listeners a week tuned in to its radio broadcasts. Its popularity, which contributed to its undoing, confirmed that there was a hunger for theater that spoke to the unsettling times. Back in August of 1938, at the end of its first week of hearings, the Dyes Committee had heard from a half dozen or so witnesses who, based on hearsay evidence and unchallenged allegations, had traduced the federal theater as communistic and its plays as subversive of American values. The accusations were front-page news. Subsequent reports of the wild and unpredictable hearings, which Americans couldn't seem to get enough of, had generated growing popular interest. With only weeks left before the committee members had to submit their report to Congress, they had not yet allowed any officials representing the federal theater to respond to these accusations. Since August, its director, Hallie Flanagan, had asked to appear at the hearings to defend the federal theater, but until now the Dyes Committee had stonewalled her. The committee couldn't hold off any longer on allowing her to speak, and President Roosevelt's administration, having previously instructed Flanagan not to engage in any kind of public comments, had reversed course as well, but belatedly recognizing the damage already done by this strategy. Flanagan had come prepared, reports and affidavits in hand. Nobody knew the Federal Theater uh, better than she uh, or could speak to it uh, uh, with greater passion. Her mission, and she's on the left up there, her mission was to defend the Federal Theater. Martin Dyes was to trip her up vilify her program, and in so doing, make national news and extend the life of his committee. Well, what Flanagan failed to grasp, and it would haunt her to her dying days, was that the hearing room, which to her producer's eye looked like a badly staged courtroom scene, offered a different sort of drama than she had ever encountered. That shop-worn set masked a nascent form of American political theater far more dangerous than the one she had come to defend. In the course of waging and winning this battle, Martin Dyes assembled a political playbook so pervasive it now seems timeless. Long before Senator Joe McCarthy began naming names of those he deemed un-American in his own hearings in the Senate, Martin Dyes had instituted the practice. Long before elected officials discovered that informal legislative guardrails could safely be ignored, that journalists rarely followed up on false claims, and that emerging, emerging media could easily be exploited, Dyes had figured all that out. Long before politicians would galvanize followers by threats of violence against their foes or brazenly play the race card, Martin Dias would, on the campaign trail, speak of assaulting a black congressman who dared to challenge white supremacy. And long before politicians realized that it was easier to attain power by battling over culture and identity, even if that meant reversing where they stood on specific legislation, Dyes had shown how winning a strategy this could be. 
and as forward-looking as Martin Dyes was, he was equally gifted at appropriating strategies others had successfully employed in exploiting grievances. Why Martin Dyes went after the federal theater can be explained in part by what Alexis de Tocqueville recognized a century earlier in his Democracy in America, published in 1835, where he writes, and I quote, that the love of the drama is most natural to democratic nations, and where he describes democracy at work in American theaters. Quote, at the theater alone do the former consent, I'm sorry, at the theater alone, the higher ranks mix with the middle and lower classes. There alone do the former consent to listen to the opinion of the latter, or at least to allow them to give an opinion at all. In a world in which, as Tocqueville put it, the pit makes laws for the boxes, those in charge outside of the playhouse, the politicians and the wealthy now sitting in America's box seats, had cause to be concerned by what Tocqueville described as theater's power to, quote, lay hold on you in the midst of your prejudices and your ignorance, and educate and rouse people to change what they believed was unjust. That, at least, is the promise or threat of theater. A century ago, when fewer than one in five American adults had finished high school, and fewer than one in 25 had earned a college degree, schooling didn't serve that purpose, and so didn't provoke the kind of controversy and censorship that America's classrooms now face. But a theater that stretched from coast to coast especially one that staged plays on social and political issues, had the potential to inform and change many minds. Martin Dyes, who believed that the increasingly popular federal theater was spreading a dangerously progressive, as well as a racially integrated vision of America, decided that it needed to be stopped. Martin Dyes entered the old congressional building that morning, bolstered by a successful weekend of politicking in New York City. Uh, on Saturday, he had spoken at a luncheon at the Hotel Pennsylvania for the 600 members of the Nationalist American Defense Society before this sympathetic crowd risking President Roosevelt's wrath. Dyes lashed out against Secretary of the Interior Harold Ikes and Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins for having gone to great lengths to ridicule and destroy his investigation. His strategy was to play the victim while wrapping himself in the flag. And he said, the enemies of this country have been stupid. Their tactics of ridicule, misrepresentation, lies, abuse have done more to arouse the patriotism of this country to the seriousness of the situation than all the testimony we have heard. I don't do justice to Martin Dyes, who was one of the great orators of his day and uh, was described as having a voice that could call pigs from 50 yards away <laughs> and they would come running. <laughs> Hallie Flanagan came prepared to share with the committee, and she is on the left, and as you can guess, Martin Dyes is next to me on this side. Hallie Flanagan came prepared to share with the committee how much the Federal Theater had accomplished in its short life, as well as to defend it from accusations that it was promoting communism. She was progressive in her worldview, a Midwesterner, and believed that theater should be, quote, a thorn in the flesh of the body politic. But she had never imposed an ideological agenda on the Federal Theater and had pushed back against radicalism in her organization. The overwhelming majority of the hundreds of productions she had approved were unobjectionable. Classical and modern drama, religious plays, vaudeville acts, marionette shows. Though a number of contemporary plays had not shied away from controversy and had angered those across the political spectrum from members of Roosevelt's administration to those opposed to it. The cost to American citizens for all this was negligible. Less than 1% of money allocated for all federal work relief. The price tag over the life of the federal theater, as Flanagan herself would put it, added up to the cost of building one battleship. The committee made 
Hallie Flanagan wait before allowing her to testify. They had invited a warm-up act. They wanted to hear from a local minister who spoke uninterrupted and interminably about, quote, the spiritual lethargy and moral indifference threatening America and recommended that radicals should be dealt with by force or persuasion, by confinement or by deportment. If Flanagan thought she was going to be treated with a similar courtesy, she was in for a surprise. She, too, had planned to read from a prepared statement, but the committee had other ideas. J. Parnell Thomas and Joe Starnes, either out of impatience or to see whether they could rattle her, began peppering her immediately with questions as soon as she was sworn in. The New York Times reported that they heckled Flanagan and interrupted each other in their eagerness to question her. The questions tumbled out, the Times wrote, so fast that she had to juggle two or three at a time and was continually cut off from completing her sentences. These congressmen were ill-equipped to deal with the hard-earned authority of a professional woman like Flanagan who refused to defer to them. Martin Dyes, who allowed the spectacle to go on for too long, at last intervened, started things over, asking Flanagan what her duties were as head of the Federal Theater. Unwilling to see to the committee members who defined what was American, or for that matter, un-American, Flanagan, in her reply, flipped the script a, a bit too wittily, saying, since August 29, 1935, I've been concerned with combating un-American activity. Dyes misheard her and said, uh, we'll get to that in a minute. So she had to repeat herself, I said, I am combating un-American inactivity. <laughs> a confused eyes asked in response, inactivity? Flanagan explained, I refer to the inactivity of professional men and women, people at that time when I took office who were on relief rolls, and it was my job to expend the appropriation laid aside by congressional vote for the relief of the unemployed as it related to the field of theater. Starnes, listening, jumped back in, cherry-picking Flanagan's official correspondence, trying to drive, I'm sorry, trying to drive a wedge between the two goals of the project that had always been in tension with each other. On the one hand, providing financial relief to thousands of unemployed actors and staging, on the other hand, first-rate productions. Flanagan, despite his interruptions, held the ground, repeatedly placing the snippets he was quoting within larger and inoffensive contexts. Once that line of attack sputtered, Starnes began another and more serious one, painting Flanagan as a communist. He began with a background, referring to the months she had spent as a Guggenheim Fellow, and she was, I think, the second woman to win a Guggenheim Fellowship. She had spent it studying theater in Europe, including Berlin, but had spent much of her time in the Soviet Union. And he interrupted her so often that his colleagues on the committee had to intercede once again. An overmatched Starnes, not yet done with proving a Russian connection, came at it a fresh way, asking whether Flanagan thought theater was a weapon. He again tried turning Flanagan's words against her, in particular a report she had written in 1931 for Theater Arts Monthly about workers' theater in America. But that line of attack was easily parried as Flanagan explained the difference between reporting on something and advocating it. Workers' theaters may have been born in America, she told him, but it was not born through me. Starnes grew increasingly agitated as Flanagan pointed out time and again that while he was quoting her article correctly, he was merely quoting information that she was reporting, not her own views. Flanagan, like everyone else in the room, knew where this line of questioning was heading. Was the federal theater promoting propaganda? Since it was impossible to deny that a small number of the federal theater plays, especially the fact-checked living newspaper dramas, were committed to political and social advocacy, Flanagan, while acknowledging that these were propagandistic, insisted that they were propaganda for democracy, propaganda for the elimination of slum dwellings, for better health care, for fairer labor practices. She concluded, 
that propaganda, after all, is education, to which Starnes had no answer. It was time again for Martin Dyes, who had been silently watching this unfold, to take over. He began by asking Flanagan about the audience that the Federal Theater had reached, the close to 30 million Americans who had by then seen at least one of its productions was, for Flanagan, a mark of its success. For Martin Dyes, it was evidence of how influential the Federal Theater had become, and if some of its plays were truly un-American, how dangerous an institution. Flanagan then refuted the accusation made by earlier committee witnesses that the Federal Theater, quote, couldn't get any audience for anything except communistic plays, pointing out its affiliation with hundreds of mainstream organizations across the land, saying, quote, note, gentlemen, that every religious shade is covered and every political affiliation and every type of education and civic body in the support of our theater. It is the widest and most American base that any theater has ever hit upon. Starnes was not yet done, failing to see the web that Martin Dyes was slowly weaving to trap Flanagan and still sure that she had confessed to communist sympathies in her article, he forced his way back into the conversation, reading aloud what he believed to be the most damning quotation from Flanagan's writings. And I'll quote him, quoting her. Unlike any art form existing in America today, the workers' theaters intend to shape the life of this country, socially, politically, and industrially. They intend to remake a social structure without the help of money, and this ambition alone invests their undertaking with a certain Marlowe-esque madness, end quote. Confident that this was conclusive evidence of socialist sympathies, he demanded to know, you are quoting from this Marlowe, is he a communist? It was a question he regretted asking until his dying day, and even after his obituary led with it. Uh, the New York Tribune called it the, the high comedy relief of the day, um, and even Flanagan joined in in the laughter and then apologized for her rude response. She then explained, I, I was quoting from Christopher Marlowe, but he still didn't get it. Tell us who this Marlowe is so we can get the proper reference because that is all we want to do. To which she replied, put in the record that he was the greatest dramatist in the period of Shakespeare immediately preceding Shakespeare. A reddened starn salvaged what he could, asking whether all drama since its origins in ancient Greece was fundamentally about social conflict and so by extension communist. Surely, he said, Mr. Euripides was guilty of teaching class consciousness. <laughs> Flanagan wasn't going to back down on Euripides. Drama going back to the Greeks had always been about social conflict and questioning the status quo. In fact, theater and democracy were twin-born in ancient Greece. Flanagan might have added that this helped account for why millions of Americans in the midst of a depression were flocking to see federal theater productions. But how could she explain that without further incriminating the federal theater in promoting class conflict to a committee that found any questioning of the way things were so threatening? Euripides, Marlowe, Shakespeare, it didn't ma make much of a difference to the committee members. If theater advocated social change, it was by default subversive, and the committee considered it communistic and un-American, and not something the United States government should be funding. Thomas now took over the questioning, steering the conversation towards specific plays. He failed spectacularly to make inroads against a, a kid's play, Revolt of the Beavers, which he tried to label as communist, and you know, even the New York Times called it Mother Goose Marx. But <laughs> it, it didn't help that none of the committee members had ever seen a federal theater play. And Flanagan, the good college professor that she was, came prepared and brought out questionnaires that little kids had filled out after seeing the Beaver play. 
The play teaches us never to be selfish, one wrote. Another, it is better to be good than bad. <laughs> With the attack heading nowhere, Thomas turned to an example that had especially infuriated him, how the New Jersey legislature, uh, at the time in which he was serving in it, was maligned in a play called Injunction Granted. What he failed to understand was the offending lines he quoted from the play were spoken verbatim by the legislators, having been reported in local newspapers. Flanagan made that clear. How could he object, she asked, to what had actually been said? A fundamental problem she was coming to realize that day was that these congressmen didn't quite grasp how plays worked or how dramatists through their characters and dialogue pitted competing points of view against each other so that it was misguided to quote any single speech and conclude that it somehow represented a play's message. She managed to make that point during Mosher's more civil questioning, saying, quote, we would be on very dangerous ground if we denominated and denounced as subversive any play in which any character opposing our own political faith appeared. For instance, she added, you might as well say that Marlowe that we discussed a while ago because he introduced the devil into Dr. Faustus had sold his soul to that devil. You might as well say that the March of Time newsreel because it quotes from Stalin is communistic or because it quotes from Hitler is fascistic. It was now mid-morning and it was left to Martin Dyes to reverse what was at this point going quite badly for his committee. Once again, he began disarmingly, asking Hallie Flanagan whether the purpose of the Federal Theater was amusement or the teaching of a particular idea. The question seems innocuous enough. It's the kind that Horace wants to ask, and English professors 2,000 years later still ask their students. Dyes kept returning to it, rephrasing his question as he patiently and inexorably approached what both he and Flanagan knew was being centrally contested. Should the federal theater be used to, to convey, quote, ideas along social, economic, and political lines? And when Flanagan objected to political, he said, leave that out, just social or economic. To which she grudgingly replied, among other things, yeah. That was all Dyes needed to hear, and he spent the next hour delving into exactly how the various federal theater plays were leftist propaganda intended to foment class struggle and undermine what was for him essential American values. The only moment that he dropped his folksy courtroom manner and turned icy was when discussing a federal theater musical currently in rehearsal, he couldn't resist reminding Flanagan of the power he yielded. The show might well reach the stage, he said, quote, unless you are interrupted by the lack of funds or some action of Congress. Having set aside for the moment the term communist, dies steadily and with increasing success, forced Hallie Flanagan to acknowledge that federal theater plays did indeed raise issues pertaining to social class and he asked her whether taxpayers should pay for plays, quote, that portray the interest of one class to the disadvantage of another, even though what those plays have to say might be accurate. When Flanagan insisted, quote, we are not doing plays to stir up class hatred, he pointedly replies, that is a question of opinion. Too late, Flanagan saw where this was going saying, quote, it's a very clever move on your part to maneuver me into a certain position. Dyes, having successfully done exactly that, came right back at her. I would not undertake to match my cleverness with you on this subject because you are so thoroughly acquainted with it. Dyes then asked her where the federal, federal theater drew a line on advocacy. At public ownership of utilities? At public appropriations of private property? Flanagan knew that heading down this path would eventually lead, as she put it, to recommending the overthrow of the United States government. And I do not want that, gentlemen, whatever some of the witnesses may have intimated. But Dyes 
was relentless, insisting that she specify what sort of advocacy went too far, or alternatively concede that she wanted theater to change America's political and economic order incrementally. The more she tried to explain how theater that questioned the status quo worked, the closer got to the headlines Martin Dyes so badly needed. Dyes was almost done now. And shifting gears, he read aloud provocative lines from a 1934 play, Stevedore, that had been a hit off-Broadway and was subsequently revived by the public theater, federal theater. Here's how the Baltimore Sun described his exaggerated performance. The recital began with a blasphemy and went on from there until dies with an apparent shudder halted himself. And I'll quote from the play he's quoting. God damn, do I look like some kind of animal? Do I look like somebody who jump over a back fence and rape a woman? Absolutely vulgar lines, dies almost hissed. The lines he recited, and probably in a, an accent in which he did so, are those of a poor black laborer, a character named Lonnie, spoken when defending himself from a false accusation that he had raped a white woman. But that storyline, at a time when black men were still being lynched in America, which explains why an outraged and terrified Lonnie is cursing, is not what concerned Martin dies. For him, the passage was about the blasphemy and obscenity that the federal theater was peddling, salacious language that the press he knew would report on. But this was as close as Dyes would venture that day to the vol volatile issue of race, which was just below the surface of so much of the testimony about the federal theater. He was well aware that over the past three years, the federal theater had broken many long-standing racial barriers, allowing whites and black actors to perform together, staging all black productions before integrated audiences in Jim Crow states, including his own Texas, that previously had outlawed such productions, and pouring federal dollars into the, quote, Negro units across America. But Martin dies as staunch a foe, a black equality as one was likely to find in Congress, knew better than to risk alienating the northern press, and knew as well that, by law, the federal theater was required to be non-discriminatory. After Dye's performance, Thomas tried once again to get back into the fray, failing to understand the show was over. Martin Dyes cut him off, asked what the hour was, and when he was told it was already a quarter after one, called for an adjournment to be followed by a fresh witness. Hallie Flanagan was stunned. Just a minute, gentlemen. Do I understand that this concludes my testimony? When Dyes replied, we'll see about that after lunch, she insisted on making a final statement to which dies, having no intention of allowing such a formidable adversary any more time to make her case, said once more, we'll see about it after lunch. As the hearing broke up, Congressman Thomas approached Flanagan, she recalled, looking jovial, and told her, you don't look like a communist, you look like a Republican. <laughs> she told him that she wanted to continue testifying after lunch, and he laughed and told her, we don't want you back. You're a tough witness, and we're all worn out. Flanagan then approached the secretary of the committee and asked that her written brief be included in the congressional record. She handed it to him, and he assured her that it would be. It, it never was. When Hallie Flanagan testified that day, she had more than held her own. Variety magazine awarding her the first round in her skirmish with the Dyes Committee. But that was no longer enough. Soon after she and Dyes debated the place of theater in American democracy, Gallup result, re, re, I'm sorry, Gallup, the pollster, released the results of its national poll, one of the first that it would release. Americans wanted the Dyes show renewed for another season. A significant majority, three quarters of Americans who had heard of the much publicized work of the Dyes Committee supported its ongoing investigations. 
Two months later, 20,000 supporters of Hitler gathered under giant swastikas at an anti-Semitic and anti-communist rally in Madison Square Garden in New York, where President Roosevelt was mocked as Franklin Rosenfeld. And the crowd gave a great ovation to Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, and words of praise were voiced as well for Martin Dies. Six months later, the Federal Theater was killed off by Congress, while the House and American Activities Committee survived until 1975. It's hard to imagine what America would be like today had support for its Federal Theater continued and the Dies Committee not been renewed. Counterfactual history is best left to novelists, but a more vibrant theatrical culture extending across the land might well have led to a more informed citizenry and, by extension, a more equitable and resilient democracy. What happened instead was Martin Dyes begat Joseph McCarthy, who begat Roy Cohen, who begat Donald Trump. I'll conclude. Of late, the Dyes playbook has once again been employed in culture wars uh, that attacked the theater, this time in America's high schools. A production of Chekhov's Three Sisters was nixed in Tennessee, since it deals with adultery. August Osage County was canceled in Iowa. The community was not ready for it. While in Kansas, students were not allowed to study, let alone stage, the Laramie Project a play about the murder of a gay student, Matthew Shepard. In a 2023 Theater Association uh, survey, 85% of American teachers of theater express concern about censorship. Not even My Beloved Shakespeare is safe. In Florida this past year, a newly minted law has led to a Midsummer Night's Dream being pulled from middle school libraries and classrooms, while Romeo and Juliet will now be taught in snippets to avoid falling afoul of a new law targeting, quote, sexual conduct. The clash between the playbooks of Martin Dyes and Hallie Flanagan continued to resonate across the land with lessons for both the right and the left and consequences for us all. Thank you. I welcome questions. Fire away. <laughs> Please. And I think there are microphones going around. And if the question is too difficult, I'll turn it into one that I can more easily answer. No, just kidding. You'll all hear the question. Go ahead. Thank you, Professor Shapiro. And Did this is a former student, so I'm, I'm braced. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did Flanagan legitimize the hearing by attending? Where was FDR actually right in, in kind of advising her to not testify? I mean, what, what was the right playbook for, for her? It's a great question. And it's a question that we wrestle with every day. You're Joe Biden's people. Do you challenge claims made against you? Do you keep silent and hope they'll blow over? Hallie Flanagan should have testified back in August and her hands were tied. Martin, um, uh, Harold Ikes had written a, a blistering essay called Loaded Dies, but FDR, after giving him permission to unload on dies, forbade him from doing so. And by the time that FDR finally realized that Martin Dies was going to not just gut the federal theater, but damage many New Deal projects, it was too late. So there's a lesson here about the relative success of one playbook as opposed to another. And when I say she regretted it to her dying day, when she was in a nursing home having contracted Parkinson's and was dying of it, she thought she heard voices in the hallway outside of her room calling her a communist. It was quite devastating. Uh, on the aisle 
in the middle. Um, a similar question about legitimation. You oh. quoted oh. a few times from the New York Times during the hearings. Would you say that legacy liberal outlets like the Times contributed to the overall project that the commission was advancing? And would you make any connections with the Times and other media today with similar culture war fronts? Sure. I'll preface it by saying I have family members that work for the New York Times, <laughs> but they would not be ashamed of my answer, which is this. You know, these hearings first took place in August, and anyone who knows anything about Washington knows August is dead. The president's on holiday. Congressmen are going home to campaign. The Die show was the only show in town. And the New York Times devoted 500 column inches to the Dyes Committee hearings, this libelous set of accusations, in September, in August and September alone. So yes, the liberal press, if you want to call it that, was complicitous in this. And only belatedly did it react. The Hearst Press was always going after Hallie Flanagan, hiring spies to open her mail and the, and, and the like. But when the New York Times is effectively undermining this progressive enterprise, it had no chance. And so much of this book, and I hope so much of my talk, landed on you in ways that made you realize the relationship between Martin Dye's playbook and the one that is well thumbed today in the halls of Congress. And uh, that's really why I wrote this book. I stumbled on something I knew very little about and uh, realized that it was a timely story because unless you understand where that playbook came from and unless you hold journalists' feet to the fire, you're going to continue to lose to people who claim that they know what it is to be American, and that's a frightening thing. A question in the back. And either way, any way you want to go. Please. Thank you so much for this talk. Um, one of the things that I, that you made so clear about um, Dai's uh, reading of, uh, of the... Um, uh, uh, of the performances was 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 how bad a reading it is, right? Taking these taking quotes out of context um, uh, and disregarding like fictionality and and the sort of theatrical frame, and but it was so convincing, right? And I'm and I know I don't, not to bring up a counterfactual what theater would have done, but what is it that like like how like a sort of question about how to. Is, does theater offer a way for audiences to think about um, narrative in a way that could have edu that like would be an educational um, uh, uh, inoculation against such bad readings, or why are these bad readings so effective within like you know the 20th century in the U.S. And you know that's the question of questions, and I was thinking about that very question uh, a couple of nights ago when I saw. Uh, uh, quite interesting and powerful play uh, in Berlin called Postcards from the East. I don't know who here had a chance to see it. You had a chance to see it. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll just explain to the audience that it's a, a play that wrestles with German and Ukrainian relations today and going back to the 1940s and asks hard question after hard question after hard question. And two things about going to that theater stood out for me. One was that young people who made up about 80% of the audience were paying less than 10 euro to go see a first-rate play, which is unheard of in New York City. And the other was they were wrapped, and there were seven ovations for the actors at the end, and they were taking in incredibly complicated historical and ethical questions. And I'm afraid to say that in America, that does not exist right now. And you cannot, you cannot have a healthy democracy, I believe, unless you have a thriving culture and a thriving theatrical culture. It's a hard argument to make, but I'm hoping that this book pushes that uh, 
to some degree. A uh, question on the right. Your left. Uh, thank you very much. This is a fascinating talk, and it, my goodness, it's it's great to hear it. Um, I'm doing uh, similar research, uh, or I've been doing similar research uh, on uh, theater in Berlin, um, and I'm amazed at, at the at the similarities. Uh, you know, so-called people's theater or revolutionary theater, um, including traveling shows, uh, presenting Shakespeare, um, uh, a lot of labor stories uh, drawn from the headline, drawn from newspapers and real life uh, in an environment of, of extreme poverty uh, where the actors themselves organize these theaters to fight poverty and spread theater through Germany. Um, they uh, dealt with it, women's issues, including birth control, uh, and it might not be hard to, to link Flanagan uh, to some of these groups when she was here. I don't know what year she was here. Uh, I'm looking at 1921 to 1933, when the last of them were shut down, of course. Um, and uh, including the most, uh, uh, I mean, there, you know, Brecht was involved and all these directors who later ended up, uh, some of them in Hollywood, um, the most high profile one was Erwin Piscator, um, who uh, after 33 went first to Moscow and then landed in New York City where he taught Marlon Brando. <laughs> so, I mean, there's a lot of linkages between I believe what you're looking at and, and Berlin history. And I'll be happy to talk to you afterwards. Sure, I'd love to. And what I should say, and I couldn't shoehorn into the talk, uh, was that she spent a lot of time in Germany and she soaked up an enormous amount of what German theater, uh, from agitprop to uh, uh, Brechtian models, to even the idea of a living newspaper, which she brought back to Vassar and then uh, carried on to uh, the federal theater. So uh, the German stage had a profound influence on her and on other leading uh, people involved in the federal theater. And um, uh, there's, she had to be extremely careful about promoting that European connection because that was the last thing that good old boys from the South wanted to hear from her in it, her defense. It, for, for what it's worth, it didn't end well here either. <laughs> True that. Uh, question in the front row. Please. Thank you very much for your talk, Professor Shapiro. I, I learned a lot. Um, so I have, I have two questions. I'll make them as brief as possible. The first one um, is, I, I saw and, and appreciated the framing of this from the period of the 1930s looking to our present day. And I was wondering if you could tell us more about the history before this, that is to say, what produces dies, right? Um, there, there has to be some, obviously, there has to be some history there. I'm not, I'm not sure what it is, so that, that's just one of them. And then the other thing that struck me as you were speaking is, as I understand the, the argument in the history that you're presenting, dies is making arguments about uh, the possible indoctrination that's going on through plays. And in the metaphor you're using to frame your argument, playbook, right, theater, um, dies is engaging in a sort of theater, right, which in fact, if I follow your argument correctly, he's using to indoctrinate a very large population of Americans. So is your argument that dice is, is right, that theater is actually indoctrinating, that, that it actually can indoctrinate very many large, right? And so what he's accusing Flanagan of seems to be what Dyes is doing. That's beautifully put. <laughs> <clears throat> and um, there's some brilliant scholarship on how Martin Dyes figured out, you know, we have the internet today, he had radio and newsreels then. And um, it's too complicated a story, but initially when radio licenses were given out in America, religious groups got hold of them. And the federal authorities decided we don't want to let them be the voice of radio in America and started restricting licenses. So you have ABC, NBC, CBS. 
ABC, NBC, and CBS had to find somebody who was acceptable, not a Father Coughlin, not a, a, a crazed uh, uh, person seemingly off the rails. Barton Dyes understood that. He was a great uh, orator. He was chummy with the press. When the hearings got boring, he'd, he'd call up his 12-year-old son to light one of his cigars or pound the gal. You know. He was just an entertaining kind of guy. And he understood Americans kind of like that. And he figured out, you know, you ask where he came from. <sighs> what I left out was he tried again and again and again with every issue from the silver market to auto workers. He, he kept wanting to get power. And he understood that the only way to get power in the United States Congress was to amass it over a 40-year period and be an old guy who was chairing a committee. So he figured out, if I had a special committee that had no rules at all, I could do whatever I wanted. And the people who gave him the committee knew this and knew him. And his first day, he said, I'm going to hold this in an upright way, and there'll be no traducing. He broke every promise. And he became one of the most popular individuals in his day, his you know, being named as potential presidential candidate. So uh, I think he is a special American product. He was a product of uh, an East Texas district that did not allow anybody who was black to vote, that because of poll taxes of $1.75, excluded most of the people in his community who were white from voting. So it was an undemocratic situation. His father had been a congressman before him, had been similarly a white supremacist. He campaigned on uh, the Confederacy, saying um, if we had not come back, heads held high, uh, blacks would be running this country instead of whites, and he didn't use the word blacks. He knew how to push those buttons. So was he doing the very same thing? Was he creating a different kind of theater? Do we recognize it as theater? Is it propaganda? Anybody who listens to Fox News can trace that right back to Martin Dyes. And yes, indeed, that is propaganda. Or else people wouldn't think what they think in large swaths of my country today. Question in the middle? You get to choose. Thank you for this um, scary, very scary lecture in this year, uh, election year. I have a question and, a, and an idea maybe for you. The um, uh, question is, uh, if I got it right, uh, nobody really knows about this history. It, it's, it's pretty much forgotten, uh, although we see the consequences and, uh, well, how strong it still is. And my idea was, listening to you, um, it should be staged. Uh, uh, you have a play here and uh, <laughs> a pretty uh, rough drama and uh, maybe the next Oppenheimer because it's uh, not by chance uh, <laughs> it's the same or similar uh, uh, method of, of, of questioning and, uh, and insulting people and getting somewhere politically and uh, it's probably the next big uh, there has to be Blockbuster. I know. There <laughs> has to be a young you. playwright in this room no, honestly. that I hope is going to stage this play. And I should say that history, in a sense, repeats itself. Uh, Wieland Schulz Kiel is somewhere in the audience here. Yeah. And where is he? Thank you. He produced a, a fascinating set of documentaries, films, on this very subject back in the 70s, and then it disappeared. And I should say that when he did that series of um, documentaries, the federal theater materials, which are government property, were put into wooden crates and shipped off as quickly as possible. And nobody kind of remembered where they were <laughs> until two, you know, a quarter century passes and two intrepid professors uh, 
decide they're going to hunt this down, and they find it in an abandoned uh, airport in suburban Baltimore, covered in pigeon droppings, and they found this wealth of materials. I, I should say, um, one, of, one of the plays that uh, I write about uh, in, in this book, which will come out, I hope, uh, this summer, is a play that I mentioned at the outset called Liberty Deferred. And it is a play that goes back to 1619 and exposes the origins of racism in America. And it has some of the best and most powerful scenes of any play I've ever read. And it has never been performed. And it wasn't performed by the federal theater because white officials slow walked it because it was so powerful and so explosive and dealing in uh, trenchant ways with subjects like lynching. Martin dies is Texas, his senior year of high school. Kids could leave school and watch two lynchings that year in a tiny town of Beaumont, Texas. Th this was the America that shaped Martin dies, And I'm afraid we may be back in a world that is in turn shaped by him. And that's why, as you say, it's a scary, I don't mean to scare or depress, I mean to say that I have an obligation as a humanist to engage in this. And you know, I spent, I don't know, 25 years writing books about two years in Shakespeare's life. And, uh, and then Donald Trump won in 2016. And I said, I can't write about Shakespeare's England anymore. I have to write about uh, uh, the politics of my own country. And it's, I, knew, I never studied American history. Uh, I had to do a lot of remedial work in, in doing this. And I'm hoping to make that remedial work easier for those who come after me. Please. Well, I was in theater, so I got a theater voice. But um, good. So I had a question uh, about the time frame with the radio plays. Uh, my dad was the youngest of thirteen, born on the farm in Wisconsin in 1938, and the radio had a very, very, very major, powerful. It was a tool back then. It's the reason they went with FDR and helped them in the New Deal to keep the family together during the farm. What was the time frame of? The, I mean, were they afraid of this spreading through radio into more radio plays? Like, I'm just kind of curious, what were the parallels in the times there? Because it looks like what you're writing about here was the portable theater that was actual physical theater in front of people. But was this also parlaying and segueing into uh, the radio plays? Absolutely. I mean, uh, I, I read it too quickly at the beginning. Ten million listeners a week tuned into federal theater radio broadcasts, and this was incredibly powerful. Now, Martin Dice could do six hours of programming for NBC alone this spring and a couple more for ABC and CBS, but we're talking about a steady stream of culture and plays you know, about the plight of farmers being heard by farmers who now understood somebody was giving a voice to what they were experiencing. To people who were invested in the status quo in America, the federal theater was beyond the pale. And uh, one of the saddest things for me to read is congressmen standing up in the, in the United States Senate and the United States House and reading titles of plays aloud, strung together, you know, the bitter wife, ha ha ha, and they, you know, they'd make comment after comment and bring the house down, and you realize that the debased Congress of today was equally a debased Congress back then. But that having been said, when somebody stood up and said, "We're going to create." a House on Activities Committee to decide who and what is an American, that is a disaster. People will spend the rest of their lives trying to exonerate themselves. Don't do this. And one of the leading spokesmen for that was a man named Maverick. And the word Maverick comes from his relative before him who was a Maverick. And he lost office because of his opposition to this. And 
the greatest and most painful irony for me in all this was the discovery. And it only came out after the fall of the Soviet Union and its archives being opened up. But the driving force to create a House Un-American Activities Committee was a man named Samuel Dickstein, who represented mostly my fellow Jews in a New York district of Congress. And he had been involved in previous anti-Nazi short-term Senate investigations. And he was relentless. And people just, fellow congressmen said, you know, just sit down, shut up, go away. You're a foreign-born Jew. We're not going to put you in charge of this committee. And it turns out, after the opening of the Soviet archives, the reason he was so strong in advocating this was because he had approached the Soviet Union and said, I'm happy to give you information in exchange for money. And they said, how much do you want? And he named the big number. And they said, you got to be kidding. He said, yeah, the Brits and the Poles, they, they don't question when I offer to sell them information. So the Soviets paid up, assuming that he was going to chair this committee. And um, of course, Martin Dice made sure he had nothing to do with this committee. The Russians, I think his code name for him was the crook. And, uh, uh, and of course, the irony is his advocacy for the creation of this committee, which Martin Dice cleverly stepped into, became the bane of communists in America. So be careful what you wish for. You'll be wary of crooks. Let me take a couple more questions, please, over here. I know there are drinks outside, right. and you've all um, been extremely so, Again, also for me, thank you for this wonderful lecture, for your great work. Um, I had recently an unsettling experience, and I wonder if you have a ready-made weapon against that in terms of defending the theater. A young woman who I consider bright, a relative, quoted a play out of context, a, a character, and confused the misogynist character with a misogynist playwright and really demanded a play like this cannot be staged today. This is probably a woman who calls herself a left-leaning liberal. What, what do you answer? You have students, what do you answer? What I would say, without knowing the particularities of this, I'll give a generalized answer about the fate of the federal theater. One of the reasons that the right was able to destroy the federal theater was that it was a progressive theater, but it wasn't a leftist, hard leftist theater. And because of that, the hard leftists savaged it again and again. And because the far left weakened the progressive federal theater, the right was able to swoop in and destroy it. Am I saying that's what's happening today? You get to make that call on individual basis. But from where I stand as an American voter, that is a genuine threat. And uh, it's something that keeps me up late at night. Dan, you get the last question because you were so gracious in uh, curtailing your remarks. Well, uh, it's on? Yeah. Uh, the politics of the period were incredibly interesting and complicated. Uh, Dyes was a Democrat. The Democrats controlled uh, the House, the Senate, the, and the White House, not the Supreme Court, but all, everything else. What um, can you give a, a thumbnail sketch of how uh, the dies uh, bowl, ball started rolling and how the administration decided to cut the theater program loose? Great question. Uh, and it goes back to your question earlier, how did Martin Dyes get created? Martin Dyes was also, um, let's just say, a bit player in the larger designs of a now largely forgotten vice president to FDR, a man named Nance, famous only today for saying uh, that being a vice president wasn't worth a bucket of warm piss. Uh, <laughs> He was another good old boy from Texas, from Uvalde, Texas. And he actually had his own political aspirations. He only agreed to be Roosevelt's vice president 
when Roosevelt was running and it looked like he might not get over the top. He threw his votes to Roosevelt. And even though he was anything but a progressive, uh, he was a party guy, Democrat party guy. When Roosevelt started going after, um, let's just say, recalcitrant members of the Democratic Party and wanted to make it a more progressive party, Nance was furious. And what he did was pick a nobody without any congressional gravitas or years of experience. Martin dies because he knew he had him in his pocket. And he put him into this position of power, put him into uh, a member of the most powerful committee in the House, and used him to undermine FDR, and the fingerprints would not, uh, or the trail, would not lead back to uh, Nance himself. And uh, he makes Mitch McConnell look like an amateur. He was somebody who understood how to manipulate uh, and uh, anything he wanted in Congress, and he continued to do so. And Martin Dice kind of licked his finger, put it up in the air, and realized Americans were kind of tired of giving money to poor people. And uh, his main, main hobby horse, until he became Mr. Uh, communist and un-American. You know, when he first started to run for office, he was attacking capitalism. And then he understood that was not a good way <laughs> to become wealthy and famous and influential. So he decided to... Uh, he, somebody once wrote, he held every possible political position uh, you could. He was a man with no beliefs. He just wanted power. And uh, that, too, is an important lesson for us. And he understood that Americans were tired of immigrants. So for his first three years in Congress, even though in 1924 America had passed stringent laws against immigration that would not be changed until the 1960s. Dyes wanted to ship them all back home, send them back to wherever they came from. And this is you know, a recurring American nightmare. Uh, I'll leave you on that happy note. <laughs> I'm really grateful this is for those questions. <laughs>